the cause and effect are not necessarily cleaner water or air or protected habitats, but more degradation to our free market society and our economic base as a country. Agriculture is the driving force here in Monterey County. Nearly every local job depends on our industry in some way as we are a single industry dependent here. By forcing additional or conflicting regulations on an industry already challenged to be sustainable in our newly green society, we are tearing down the most important element of our society, our safe, abundant food supply. We all drink the same water and we all drink, eat, breathe the same air. And I thank you for your time and providing this opportunity for us to speak as farmers. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Gerard. Thank you, Chairman Issa, members of the committee. Um, and thank you again for convening this hearing and allowing me to speak before you today on a topic so critical to American agriculture. My name is Mike Gerard. I'm the President and CEO of Man Packing Company, uh, located here in the Salinas Valley for the last 72 years. Our company ships field packed as well as fresh cut value added vegetable commodities to customers here in California, across the country, and Canada. We are local and national, contributing to the health and well being of people in California and across the country. Moreover, our growers and I employ 3,100 agricultural workers in Salinas who contribute to the economic strength of this community. As you are aware, Today, the produce industry is facing a multitude of challenges, but none perhaps as significant as environmental regulation. We are concerned with the process being used by the U.S. EPA and other relevant federal agencies to advance environmental regulation. In a nutshell, the process is broken. Regulations are being promulgated, promulgated in a siloed fashion without taking into account complete scientific information, the use of real world data, or adequate input from agricultural stakeholders, including farmers. In my testimony, I will focus on the issue of numeric nutrient criteria, which are used by regulators to establish the amounts of nutrients allowed for discharges into waters, such as ditches, canals, streams, rivers, and lakes. NNC are also used to determine if a body of water is impaired under the Clean Water Act, which triggers total maximum daily loads, a calculation of the maximum amount of a pollutant that a body of water can receive and still safely meet water quality standards, and a torrent of mandatory requirements on dischargers. America's farmers have made great progress in reducing the loss of nutrient and sediment from their land. The use of inputs is declining. The efficiency of nitrogen use is improving. We remain, we remain committed to continuing this progress. But the current spat of NNC policies are not economic for growers who are facing the imposition of impractical controls, administrative burdens, and timelines. The science behind the development and use of NNC is often criticized as inadequate for the establishment of fair and sound water quality regulatory standards. The ability to correlate NNC with actual biological conditions and across geographic areas is limited. When NNC are established incorrectly, they are costly to the regulated community and leave questions as to the observable impact on the actual biological conditions of the waters being regulated. On the national stage, the NNC policies established in Florida and the Chesapeake Bay watershed are front and center, and now have established a template for how NNC should be structured nationwide. In Florida, the requirements and development are the result of a settlement agreement with activists, which is not only highly problematic, but also raises fundamental questions of fairness and transparency, and effectively undermines the rights of the regulated community to customary open proceedings. Agriculture has urged U.S. EPA to delay further NNC policymaking until it has effectively engaged all relevant stakeholders in a thorough and transparent review of the strategic direction of NNC policies. We asked EPA to revisit and update the 1998 National Strategy for the Development of Regional Nutrient Criteria to table the NNC for Florida's lakes and streams slated for implementation this fall. To work instead on these issues in concert with the NNC, EPA is planning to finalize in August 2012 for all of other Florida waters. As part of this process, we believe EPA must answer the numerous and significant scientific, economic, and policy questions about these in NNC in an open and transparent manner and reject policy making by settlement agreement and its inherent opaqueness and distrust that creates. Revisiting and updating the 1998 national strategy is warranted. During the 12 years since the strategy was issued, a considerable body of applied scientific knowledge and policy experience has been developed by the research community, states, and EPA. Work on NNCs 
at the state level has involved considerable debate on substantive matters within states, between states, and between EPA and the states. Much remains unresolved. This substantive experience with the difficult scientific and practical pitfall, pitfalls of NNC needs to be drawn upon to develop a sound path forward for NNC policies in general. In the case of Florida, there are significant questions about the statistical, modeling, and biological science used by EPA. By EPA's own admission in the proposed rulemaking, there is no scientifically established correlation between what has been proposed in NNC in Florida and the desired biological conditions for the regulated waters. In general, in general, we believe there is a serious lack of rigorous, generally accepted science that justifies the particular methods EPI adopted to generate the NNC in Florida. In addition, since the development of the 1998 national strategy, there has been little or no significant or organized public participation in NNC policy development. An open and transparent process is essential if specific NNC being advanced by EPA and the states are to be embraced. There is certainly a far more, a far more acceptable process than letting policy being driven by settlement agreements developed behind closed doors solely with activist groups, as has been the recent case with NNC and in another important Clean Water Act policy areas. One of the most serious drawbacks of the 1998 national strategy is that it failed to undertake any substantive analysis of the economic costs and benefits of NNC for the regulated community, for the economy as a whole, and for the public sector that must develop and administer the NNC. In the particular case of the Florida NNC, it is very clear that adopting the wrong criteria can cause enormous economic harm, both in the direct cost to the regulated community but also for the economy as a whole. The Florida Department of Agriculture estimates that the total initial cost for agricultural producers to comply with the NNC for lakes, rivers, and streams to be between $855 million and $3 billion, and the subsequent annual cost compliance to be $902 million to $1.6 billion. As a result, they estimate that the size of the Florida economy will be reduced by $1.1 billion a year and that 14,000 full and part-time jobs will be lost. Not just agriculture is at risk. The Florida Department of Environmental Protection estimates that the total capital cost for utilities to comply with these NNC would be approximately $4.1 billion. The Florida Water Environment Association estimates the cost for compliance with all of the NNC that EPA has under development to be between $47 and $98 billion over 30 years. It also estimates that the average household utility bill will increase between $673 and $726 a year. The size of these costs for Florida alone are reason enough to justify revisiting the national strategy to ensure that a sound and responsible path forward is developed. Lastly, with regard to the substance of the proposed NNC, EPA needs to fully consider the implications and outcomes that will result if it sets the NNC for the lakes and streams at standards that are far too stringent, impractical, and unattainable for Florida and the rest of the United States. The goals of the Clean Water Act must not be set and pursued in isolation from all the other important goals and pri priorities that society has, including promoting vibrant, strong, job-creating businesses, economically strong communities, and the protective and valuable use of the land for agricultural and other purposes. For all these reasons, it is imperative that EPA open a meaningful working dialogue on the strategic direction of NNC policies. The dialogue must be carried out with all the relevant stakeholders in an open and transparent manner, not simply with the activist NGOs. In the particular case of the Florida NNC, given the host of legitimate economic and scientific questions and issues, the NNC must be subjected to further scientific development and review as part of EPA's broader effort involving the NNC for the other waters of the state. This work on the Florida NNC should be carried out in a parallel to the national working dialogue agriculture has suggested. In the Chesapeake Bay watershed, the recently finalized EPA-issued Chesapeake Bay total maximum daily load could push hundreds of thousands of acres of productive farmland out of cropland. EPA projects that roughly 20 percent of cropland in the watershed, about 600,000 acres, will have to be removed from production and be converted to grassland or forest in order to achieve the required loading reductions. This, despite the USDA <coughs> National Resources Conservation Service's finding in its draft 2010 report on the progress made by agriculture and conservation and national resource improvements from 2003 to 2006, the farmers were actively implementing erosion control practices on about 9 
96 percent of the cropland acres in production in that watershed. As a result, NRCS states that sediment contributions from cultivated cropland to the bays, rivers, and streams are reduced by 64 percent, nitrogen by 36 percent, and phosphorus by 43 percent. Nonetheless, the progress made by agriculture was seemingly ignored. EPA moved forward with an unnecessarily inflexible new plan to regulate farming practices in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. In developing this plan, EPA relied on a scientific model the EPA itself admits was flawed and failed to give stakeholders a meaningful opportunity to review its assumed facts. The rigidity of the plan also appears to limit the state's flexibility to change and adapt their water quality plans, even though EPA regulations specifically allow states to modify water water quality goals when necessary to avoid substantial economic and social disruption. The Bay States estimate the implementation will cost billions of dollars, seven billion for Virginia and three to six billion for New York alone. With regard to nutrient standards closer to home, farmers in the Central California coast are experiencing firsthand how federal regulatory policy is driving <coughs> their state regulatory process for water quality. The Central Coast Regional Water Quality Control Board is in the process of developing a new regulatory paradigm for California farmers in the Central Coast in much the same manner as the requirements in Florida and the Chesapeake Bay watershed, i.e. without full use of available scientific data, real world information, and adequate stakeholder outreach. As this is in my own backyard, I'd like to describe some of the other specifics. The order that is being contemplated would automatically place growers of nutrient-intensive commodities into a high-risk category and require costly on-farm monitoring, development, and implementation of detailed management plans and require unachievable reductions in nutrients by unrealistic timelines. Specifically, growers will be required to demonstrate the irrigation runoff does not cause or contribute or to exceedances of nutrient water quality standards in waters of the state of the United States or the United States within four years of the adoption of the proposed order. To do this, they will be required to monitor individual discharges at the farm level, demonstrate a 50 percent reduction in two years and a 75 percent reduction in three years. As noted earlier, agriculture is willing and already working to reduce the deleterious impacts on, of nutrients in water quality through new technologies such as slow re release fertilizers, careful development of nutrient budgets, and reducing the amount of water that runs off an operation, the regional goals that are born out of flawed numeric nutrient criteria policies will be impossible to achieve. Mr. Chairman, let me put this in simple economic terms. In a preliminary study conducted by the Grower Ship Association of Central California, it is estimated that the Central Coast could lose between $231 and $298 million in business revenue, between $19 million and $25 million in tax revenue, and could lose as many as 3,300 jobs. In the Central Valley, despite the significant progress growers have made in meeting water quality objectives by the implementation of best management practices, the Central Valley Regional Water Quality Control Board is moving toward requiring all growers, regardless of growing practices and or threat to surface or groundwater, to comply with the new requirements. These include geographic commodity specific general waste discharge requirements and or conditional waivers of WDRs that would include surface and groundwater monitoring and management plans, <coughs> individual farm evaluations, and individual certified nutrient management plans which would dictate how much and when a nutrient is allowed to be applied. Staff recognizes that implementation of this type of regulation would result in some prime unique farmland and farmland of statewide importance being converted to non-agricultural use. In closing, we are asking for you to help to fix the broken environmental regulatory process. We need to depend on a process that uses best available science, takes into account operational data, and encourages input from the agricultural stakeholders. Without this certainty, our livelihoods and the food and fiber we produce for this country are threatened. Thank you for caring enough to come here today and your consideration. Well, thank you. Ms. Murari, and would you pronounce your name so I stop sure. <laughs> messing it up? It's Murai. Murai. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And you're from Oceanside, so that makes it particularly bad. Uh, <laughs> that is in my congressional district. Thank you. <laughs> Well, good morning, Chairman Issa and Congressman Farr. My name is Mark Murai. I'm a third generation farmer. Our family farm is located in Oceanside, California. For the past five years, I have served as president of the California Strawberry Commission. The commission represents all of California's strawberry shippers, processors, and more than 500 family farms. The average California strawberry farm is 73 acres. 
California strawberry farmers are able to achieve the highest yield in the world on these small farms that dot California's coast. Collectively, California strawberry farmers grow over 88 percent of the strawberries for the nation and create over 70,000 on-farm jobs. In other words, California strawberry farmers are the most efficient farmers in the world, able to grow the most fruit per acre than any other strawberry farmer in the world. This hard work ethic is also what supports California farmers to comply with over 70 laws and regulations. Many of these government requirements originate with the US EPA. For example, US EPA has one of the toughest pesticide registration programs on the globe. And after a product is registered by the US EPA, it is reviewed again by California EPA. I'm going to give you three examples um, and re reiterate some of the, uh, the, the items around the Endangered Species Act first. The Endangered Species Act requires federal agencies to consult with the National Marine Fisheries Service and the Fish and Wildlife Service, the services. The agency actions that could impact threatened or endangered species on their critical habitats. The consultation process was guided by an optional process created in 2004 for consultation between EPA and the services to address the impacts of pesticides on endangered species called the counterpart regulations, which established alternative consultation processes so that EPA could fulfill its ESA obligations and to make consultation process more flexible, efficient, and timely. However, as a result of an activist lawsuit, Judge Kofner in the U.S. Ninth Circuit Court invalidated parts of the counterpart regulations based on his belief that the process violated the ESA procedural obligation, not because there's any actual harm to any endangered or threatened species. As a result, in essence, the ESA mandated process would require the US EPA to conduct one comprehensive review and then the EPA would then send the data to the US Fish and Wildlife Service or the National Marine Fisheries Service for them to review the data once more. The service then would complete their review called the biological opinion, which could, contain, which could contain restrictions on pesticide use. Then the service would send back to the EPA for yet another review so that EPA could determine whether alternative restrictions could be instituted. The result is yet another regulatory process, and for California, we now have three reviews of the same product. However, the biggest problem is that the National Marine Fisheries Service has no expertise and no experience in pesticides. As a result, their reviews to date are grossly flawed as they are based on old data, old use patterns, old agronomic practices, and non-peer-reviewed information. Furthermore, because of a combination of a lack of expertise and resources, not one consultation has been completed to the point of implementation, despite court-ordered schedules. Given these circumstances, there are so many problems that both state and federal government officials have expressed great concern. Let me read to you several quotes from letters by US EPA the California Department of Pesticide Regulation, and Washington Department of Agriculture. First, the following examples are comments from the National Marine Fisheries Service recent series of biological opinions to determine if any of the 54 pesticides that have a negative impact on Pacific salmon that run in rivers from Canada to Mexico. First, the Washington State Department of Agriculture. Quote, since 2003, WSDA, Washington State Department of Agriculture, has invested significant financial and technical resources in the, in, in the collection of monitoring data for salmon bearing waters in Washington State. Water samples are collected weekly from 13 salmon bearing streams during typical pesticide use season. The monitoring locations sampled represent various agricultural areas and one urban area in Washington State. Over the course of six consecutive years of sampling, only one detection of malathion in 2004 exceeded the no jeopardy concentration of 1.122 parts per billion. 
At a minimum, we believe this indicates current label requirements are protective of water bodies similar to those currently monitored, end of quote. That's from the WSDA comment letter dated 92509. Here's a letter from the California Department of Pesticide Regulation, quote, DPR remains concerned that the deficiencies identified in our September 15, 2008 comments on the NMFS biological, draft biological opinions under the Endangered Species Act issued for chlorpyrifos, diazinon, and malathion appear to have been repeated in these new biops. Like the pre previous biops, these do not consider the best available data. For example, a review of California's surface water monitoring databases show that out of 44,641 water analysis for nine pesticides included in this biops, less than 1% of the samples exceed the proposed maximum concentration limits. Moreover, the majority of exceedances were from pesticides that are scheduled for cancellation. This data suggests that not only are the proposed reasonable and prudent alternatives not necessary, but that NMFS, NMFS modeling may have exaggerated the ad adverse risk of these pesticide to salmonids. Continuing the quote, additionally, these biops continue to lack transparency. For example, the RPA section establishes a process to determine an adequacy of suggested risk reduction measures without identifying the criteria or data that will be used. Thus, NMFS has made it impossible to determine, to determine and meaningfully comment on additional risk reduction measures described in element three. And that's from a comment, DPR comment letter dated 716 of 2010. Now here's a letter from US EPA. Quote, use of the pesticides has been ongoing for decades and has actually declined over the past several years. If the threatened status of the species has not changed appreciably during this considerable period, it would appear to provide some indication that the use of these pesticides are not appreciably reducing the likelihood of both survival and recovery, which is the standard for jeopardy. Yet the draft makes no effort to address these empirical evidence. Additionally, the draft makes no mention of the fact that agricultural, agriculture chemicals are secondary stressors and therefore are considered to be minor factors in species survival relative to other factors. Continuing the quote, the draft lacks the level of transparency necessary for EPA to understand NMFS rationale for its opinion that any of these pesticides will jeopardize the continued existence of any of the species at issue. It is generally not transparent as to what methodology NMFS employed to collect the information. It is also unclear how NMFS undertook specific analyses and how NMFS integrated or reconciled apparently conflicting information." End of quote. U.S. EPA Office of Prevention Pesticides and Toxic Substances letter dated September 15, 2008. So how does this impact agriculture? Based on these erroneous studies, the National Marine Fisheries Service will now require buffers ranging from 125 feet to 1,000 feet. These buffers will result in hundreds of thousands of acres being taken out of production or suffering from severe infestation. Additionally, this year, the Center for Biological Diversity filed the same type of procedural lawsuit on 400 pesticides listing hundreds of species. If it takes National Marine Fisheries Services over a decade to evaluate 54 pesticides for one species, imagine how long it will take to evaluate 400 pesticides for multiple species located throughout the U.S. At the current rate, it would take over 500 years. This does not help farmers or fish. I'm going to go into a different topic now. Um, and this has to do with the US EPA ozone standard. As you know, the California mountains act to capture natural and man-made organic compounds that evaporate into the air called volatile organic compounds, VOCs, and emissions from cars and factories, which is nitrous oxide. California's sunny climate then causes the emissions to, emissions to form ozone. In the 1990s, US EPA required state 
states to develop state implementation plans, or SIPs. As a result of these plans, California farmers were asked to do their part to reduce VOC air emissions from organic and conventional pesticides. In response, California strawberry farmers have implemented a variety of new technologies that reduce VOC air emissions. More specifically, since the 1994 SIP was approved, strawberry farmers have reduced VOC emissions 30 to 50 percent, depending on each individual farm. Ten years later, Ventura Air Pollution Control District issued a press release stating, quote, best air on record and noted that Ventura County had met the US EPA one hour ozone standard for three years in a row and was now in compliance. Instead of supporting this accomplishment, activists sued the state of California for failing to implement a separate regulation. Unfortunately, lawsuits don't make sense. As more information emerged about this issue, it made less sense. According to the California Air, Re Air Resources Board emissions inventory, approximately 40% of the VOCs in Ventura County are from naturally occurring sources. Thus, total VOCs from pesticides are less than 4% of all VOCs in Ventura County. Moreover, the inventory shows that 46% of these emissions are from methyl bromide, and US EPA has previously stated that methyl bromide would qualify as a VOC exempt under current policy according to Jeffrey Holmstead, November 13, 2003. So after removing methyl bromide from the inventory, actual VOCs from pesticides are less than 2% of all VOCs in Ventura. So once again, out of the 4% that organic and conventional pesticides make up, 40, 4%, 46% of that 4% is made up of methyl bromide, which is not even a VOC. UC Davis professor Dr. Peter Green has been funded by the state of California to conduct independent scientific research about reactivity of nitrous oxide and VOC. He testified to the Air Resources Board that, quote, organic gases react photochemically, however, they do not react equally. Methyl bromide has such a very, very low acti reactivity that it would be reasonable to exclude it from regulation at a ground level ozone precursor. Furthermore, ozone production is strongly dependent on nitro nitrogen oxide, nitrous oxide which must also continue to be reduced. This is especially true in, in air basins under conditions where nitrous oxide is the limiting reagent and where natural background VOCs limit our ability to reduce total VOCs. In other words, there are so much naturally occurring VOCs that even if you eliminated all VOCs from agriculture, it would have no effect on ground level ozone. Because the amount of ozone that will be created is based upon emissions from cars and factories, nitrous oxide from burning of fossil fuels. Unfortunately, after 16 years of having this type of information, US EPA continues to require the obsolete requirements identified in 1994 that must continue forever. And after 14 years, US EPA continues to ignore the petition to take methyl bromide off the list of VOCs. One last example. I'd like to briefly discuss the Montreal Protocol and restrictions on methyl bromide. As you know, methyl bromide is highly efficacious fumigant and has been used for a half, more than a half century for more than 100 crops. In forests, ornamental nurseries, wood products to clean the soil before planting, or as a post-harvest treatment. However, as an international treaty, an international treaty called the Montreal Protocol has phased out over 90% of agricultural uses of methyl bromide. To date, methyl bromide alternatives have been identified for nearly all crops. Strawberries are the largest exception. Australia, Israel, Italy, Japan, Spain, and numerous other countries are all requested critical use exemptions for strawberries. Within the past three years, EPA has approved substitute products to clean the soil. They have approved methyl iodide. For post-harvest uses, they have approved sulfuryl fluoride. As a result, EPA has reduced the amount of methyl bromide critical use exemption application by more than 50%. Now, after reducing the availability of methyl bromide, US EPA is taking comment on canceling both, both of these substitute products, methyl iodide and sulfuryl fluoride. Today as you hear this hearing, as you hold this hearing, 
US EPA is taking comment on its proposed decision to cancel sulfurofluoride for post-harvest treatment. And that's similarly, the US EPA is taking comment um, on a petition to suspend, suspend and cancel methyl iodide. We are concerned that EPA has reduced the CUE, that's the critical use exemption for methyl bromide, by 50% because it said that new alternatives were available. But they have taken no action to cancel the but they have taken no action to cancel, they have taken action to cancel those alternatives, and EPA has failed to make any corrective action to restore the CUE. These are just some examples of the impacts to agriculture. I'd be happy to answer any questions at this time. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, as I said, we're going to probably go back and forth quite a bit here. Uh, Mr. Meary, uh, I had the pleasure or displeasure of going uh, to the annual trips for Montreal, Montreal Protocol over the years. And as I've watched the reduction, I've watched it with a little bit of horror. Isn't it true that basically as virtually every uh, agricultural use for methyl bromide has been ratcheted down here in the U.S. with the sterilization and so on for strawberries be one of the notable exemptions that uh, other countries have flourished by being able to continue to use this low-cost alternative for years past the time that uh, the United States forced a higher cost, uh, in some cases now being taken away, substitute. Yeah, I think, I think to be fair, um, they were on, many countries were on a different time schedule of being a, de a developing country, and that was, that was, we understood that. But California and California strawberry growers have invested the most money throughout the world, has developed some of the alternatives that, are, are, that we're transitioning to. Unfortunately, regulation, and this is something that the United Nations does not even understand, that the sovereign body of California has a regulatory um, process that's even above the US EPA and inhibits further transition to some of the alternatives. So we are under, now we, we are coming to the point of, of competition and unfair, uh, an uneven uh, playing field. And it's, it's very uh, discouraging to um, think of um, where um, our industry can, will be uh, or many industries if, if we have infected soils and there's no way to, to, to clean them up. Global, the global economy is contributing to the spread of insects and diseases throughout the world. And so we have to have a method, just like our bodies take medicine, we have to have a, a way to clean up our homes from termites, our soil from disease and pests. And, uh you know, also having cut flowers in, in San Diego, we're well aware that they've watched their industries move to South and Central America, uh, specifically because of the access to not just cheap labor, but uh, to chemicals not available in the U.S. Let me just go back on one thing. You know, you, you had a long and wonderful testimony, and I, I appreciate everything that was in it, but can I reduce down how you're being dealt with on these pesticides, maybe to an example, and if you agree with it, let me know. What you're really being told is that you're speeding, but you haven't yet gotten in the car. You've been given the ticket for speeding, and now your job is to prove that your car can't go over 55 miles an hour. Is that, to a lay person, isn't that the demand you have, is that there's been no proof that a particular pesticide, or 54 of them, are being uh, put excessively into the watershed by your company or by your, your uh, industry, and yet you're having to prove that whether it's steelhead or salmon or any other uh, species, because as you said, there are a lot more coming, you have to prove the negative. You have to prove that you're not. Well, in fact, you're, uh, you haven't, you know, you, they haven't yet proven that you have. Isn't that effectively the case, is all they need is an endangered species and a pesticide, and then you must prove there's no link. Would that be fair for a layperson to, to feel you just said? That's, it's, it's the most, as a farmer, I, you sit in your pickup and you pat on your steering wheel and you just can't believe this process is happening. When you even have the other regulatory agencies of the state, uh, other states, put in comment letters that say the process is flawed, and yet we, we are not acting to correct this. So not everyone has said you're not speeding, just a whole bunch of states have said you're not speeding and you're still not allowed the keys to the car. 
Yes, and, and if you look at our future, if you look at the the consultation of the or the opinions that need to be formed taking a half a millennia, how if we have a backlog of half a millennia, how are we even going to advance our agricultural technology to um, uh, you know, softer products, more e efficacious products, more efficient products, tools that farmers can use? It's very discouraging. Well, since I have the ranking member uh, on the Agriculture Committee and someone who's been looking at these issues locally for, uh, I don't know, about half a century, if we can admit that you're nearly that old, uh, why don't I yield for your, for your questions? Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, let, let's put this into some perspective. I mean, we've been farming in this valley for about 170 years, and the regulations started probably about 40 years ago. Uh, and the history of this valley, when you get into, um, you know, the nitrate load in this valley, was all dairy farming. That's how it all started. And uh, you can imagine all those uh, cattle, um, cows on, on the land and the nitrate that they uh, put on the land in the first place. Uh, and, and I think the, the difficulty is that, you know, we've been living with a lot of government around us. We're surrounded. This county has billions of dollars of federal um, investment in this county within, you know, the, the military properties here. And the military property is important to agriculture because we lease Fort Hunter Leggett and, and uh, for cattle grazing. And, and uh, we have Bureau of Land Management. We have the EPA. We have uh, National Marine Fisheries. We have a National Marine Sanctuary here. We have a National Marine Estuary. We have uh, the um, National Park Service with the Pinnacles, the National Forest Service with Los Padres National Forest. Uh, we've got a lot of government around us and those are just the federal side and along along you know the feds come up with their rules and then the state has Department of Fish and Game Department of Food and Ag the County Ag Commissioner Larry, Larry, uh, Eric Lorison's here uh, State Water Control Board and State uh, Water Control Board and State Air Board and none of these organizations talk to each other and that's what uh, some of the discussion by by Tom Nassif is about you know let's in, let's really engage in a much more effective consultation process uh, I, I don't know whether we're going to, you know, I've served as a county supervisor, state legislator, and a, and a congressman, and I probably voted for a lot of these laws, but I never voted with them the intent that they wouldn't be operative, that they wouldn't be, and I, and I think what we have, and you're the, you're the chair of the reform committee, this really calls out for a, a bigger reform, and let me just suggest something. Uh, California is a is a, is a well-planned state. We require every city to have a general plan. They have to go through all kinds of uh, uh, checkoffs in order to have that plan. Counties have to have general plans. And in the coastal system, we have to have local coastal management plans. One of those things that they do is they get every all the players in the room to talk about you know, all of the expected uses and how you're going to deal with those. It seems in farming we don't have that. I mean, we don't, I, I don't know whether we're ever going to get these agencies to talk to each other. And Tom, you're absolutely right about the fact that it's, it's really uh, litigious. And they can sue in state court or federal court. Uh, but once you have a plan, you then have, you've, you've sort of spoken to the, to the issues, the liability issues of, 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 which I think is always addressed by best management practices, is once you have, uh, and we formed, Mr. Chairman, two coalitions here that worked really well until, until a lawsuit. Uh, one is the River Coalition. We had the idea was to, this is not a, not a core river, although you still have to get port core permits to go into it. But we ended up having the county um, water agency be the one-stop agency for these privately owned lands, as Richard Smith talked about, uh, private river, uh, where the private owner could go in and do something that was consistent with smart um, riverbank riparian management. And uh, we've been working with all the federal agencies until we, this new lawsuit came up, which is, which is, you know, frankly what's happened to the, to the people in government at all state and federal level. They're afraid to make decisions because they're being sued left and right. Congress is criticizing them. Um, 
you know, uh, the administrative arm of government may be the worst arm to be in now because you, you get it from the political side, the legislative branch, and you get it from the legal side. And, and what I found talking to a lot of the secretaries who come in to head these agencies is they just said, people are so gun shy. They don't want to suggest you do something bold because you'll be criticized for it. So maybe we in the lawmaking side ought to require, I mean, if you, what we love about this basin is look, these guys for 170 years have kept this land in agriculture when the rest of California sprawled out. And we were, we were the first, this is where California government began. This is where the Eastern Rim trade began, Pacific Rim trade began out of Monterey, those, gal those things leaving here with agricultural product. Uh, sailed right to Mexico City, uh, to Acapulco, and sailed to the Philippines, and sailed to Lima, Peru, out of Monterey. So agriculture is what's kept this uh, county in this region in its spectacular condition, and that's through private ownership. But now, you know what the rules of the game are, because every level of government uh, creates their own uh, without consultation with the other. In California, in most instances, way ahead of the federal government. Now, we've been able to create an, an air board. Uh, it is regional in these three counties. I used to sit on it as a county supervisor. I think, by and large, it's worked pretty well. And agriculture has been very supportive of keeping this air quality here. They, won't, they, want to, they don't want uh, bad air quality to affect uh, crop growth. Uh, our regional water board is not so regional, it's much bigger. It's got some problems, uh, mainly I think uh, staff uh, approaches to, to wanting to be a tough cop rather than just trying to be practical and make things work. So I, I think that we're not going to be able to solve this problem until we really create kind of a, a one stop in the whole sense of things. I, I think Mr. Uh, Groot was absolutely right that you need a place to go that you can have these permits all done in one place where everybody's sitting at the table. And if that plan is developed for this region, it's going to be different than Chesapeake and different than uh, San Diego because we are a different area. But uh, I don't know how we stop it because uh, how do you, Mr. Nassif, how do you, uh, you talk about in your suggestions is the cycle of lawsuits. Uh, do you think that just improvement of consultation will do it? And do you think that you, you, you want to reinforce the EPA's primacy in, in all pesticide decisions? Would that uh, surpass uh, California's EPA? Is this federal EPA or California EPA? And what would it do, for example, to the California law, the, the toxic uh, law that was put into our Constitution, I believe? In my st statement, I'm talking about only on the federal side as far as primacy. It doesn't relate to the distinction between the federal and the state. If EPA... You mean primacy then just among all federal agencies? Yes, because right now what, the, what EPA does is here they make a, a finding, uh, and uh, then if there's a, a consultation process, the biopsy either by National Marine Fisheries or Fish and Wildlife uh, can overturn that. And if EPA says, well, I don't agree with that, then they don't get an incidental take statement, which would provide immunity uh, from lawsuits. So there has to not to take that. So you've taken away the primary function of EPA on these issues, and you've given now the the services for which you're, with whom you're consulting uh, almost appellate power to overrule you. And if you don't agree with them, they've got the hammer of saying, well, then we're not going to provide you with immunity from lawsuits uh, if you go ahead and, and do this without taking into consideration and agreeing with our orders. So I think what you have to do is establish that once EPA makes a decision, that you don't start de novo these biological studies that could take up to 10 years uh, to complete. That you say, all right, here's the study that's already been done by EPA. Now, here's a list of things, and check the boxes. What's been done, what hasn't been done, what needs to be done. They can take some corrective action and move forward. Well, we found when cleaning up Fort Ord, we had a, uh, a habitat management plan, a cleanup plan, and EPA was the lead agency, but we got everybody in the room ahead of before we had any plans for how to develop it and really worked out a kind of one-stop master plan for how to deal with it. And I found that federal EPA was less restrictive than 
than uh, California EPA in the cleanup. They were, how deep do you have to dig down to get the lead out of the dunes that was going to be turned over to state parks? And essentially, if you only went down f a few inches and got all the lead out, you would still turn it over to state parks, but they'd have to put signs up that it was a hazardous waste site. And <laughs> so if you dealt down 12 inches. And that would not be good. Cost a lot of money, but it, we did it. Uh, but it was the US EPA was essentially backing the l lesser of standards. So it is not always the toughest cop in town. No, but as a matter of fact, we're saying we'd prefer to have <laughs> US EPA handle these things rather than some of these other agencies because they have the primary responsibility, they have the wherewithal to do these kinds of things. And as some of the others testified, you start consulting with these bodies who have no real experience in pesticides like National Marine Fisheries Service, uh, what are you going to get? How many biologists are you going to have? This lawsuit that was filed by the Center for uh, Biodiversity, uh, you're talking about 27,400 <laughs> different outcomes. What if you have to do a biological opinion on every one of them? They would never be completed in our lifetime, and the amount of money we would spend would be horrendous. And here they are filing lawsuits. What we have is, and you wonder, you know, whether you're, you've got a plaintiff and a defendant who are actually would, adverse. Would you to each suggest other. that it go beyond that? I mean, I think that it's, it's, it's. You're going to have to bring the state regulators in too, and. That's why my concept of land use planning is one where you get them in the room. I'm kind of a general plan for farming in Monterey County where everybody would, we or Central Coast, Santa Cruz, San Benito County, is sort of the watershed of Monterey Bay. That if everybody knew what, which I think is sort of what I call best management practices, that we'd all sit around and agree, yeah, we got to do this, this is smart. But then everybody knows what the rules of the game are, and sure. we don't just go in and pick out one application and say, okay, we're going to sue on that practice. Like part of it would be cleaning out the Salinas River so that when it floods, uh, the willows don't block in, you know. I don't know how much of that flooding was just due to willows, but it would have been, been less, I think. But I agree that the situation as far as who has who has real jurisdiction over these particular issues, uh, state or federal, or if it's concurrent jurisdiction as it appears to be, uh, that you're going to be able to resolve things. Do you have to get the two parties together and have some sort of agreement that if the national says something, there has to be some basis for the state then to move forward on what they do? But how about then signing it off? I mean, we have a coastal plan, which is essentially California had a plan, then they went to the 73 jurisdictions along the coast and says, you develop your plan consistent with state um, guidelines and the state guidelines were consistent with federal guidelines and then it was all sent to the Secretary of Commerce he signed off of it and now the counties and cities implement their own coastal plan they don't have federal people there looking over their <coughs> shoulders uh, perhaps you know I've been very supportive of trying to get the Ag Commissioners to be that one because we are the only state that has an Ag Commissioner in every county and they're licensed state licensed uh, uh, professionals that perhaps we ought to give that office a lot of these authorities to 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 do the oversight on on regulatory issues. Very helpful. Let me uh, follow up a little bit. Uh, you know, uh, I wasn't in government when the Endangered Species Act was passed, and it wasn't until I started getting involved in government that I began realizing that you had two distinctly different places to go for essentially the same relief under endangered species. You can go to the federal government and all their agencies, or you can go to a duplicate entity often inside the state. Let me ask a, uh, two rhetorical questions, but I do want answers to both. One is, should we revisit the Endangered Species Act to give a, ch a state, such as California, a choice? If something lies completely within its jurisdiction, meaning it is not an interstate endangered species, and we have some of those that are native only to the United States or the United States and Mexico, but uh, basically U.S., then California could choose to hold its, uh, its, its actual jurisdiction and premise and deal with it. Uh, how, unless it appears on a federal, uh, separate federal, and it would appear on a federal if either the state asked it to, the federal government felt it had to for purposes of, of if you will, the global balance, or uh, if it crosses state lines. And if it does any of those things, then the state would be out. Now, constitutionally, there's no problem with the federal government denying the state 
separate jurisdiction on an item which concerns multiple states in commerce. We do it, quite frankly, all the time. But with that limiting of, if you will, the state looking at issues that are also looked at from a federal level and requiring, the, quite frankly, the, the various states to look to one stop, would that be a first step? And we're not talking about eliminating anything off the endangered species list. If anything, states would come to the federal government and say, I've got steelhead trout and I believe they should be added and so on. Would that management system to you as Californians be unreasonable or would it in fact be a place in which all the parties would go to one place so that you wouldn't be finding yourself with two separate and distinct entities often unable to uh, come to a common conclusion? You said it was a rhetorical question, but you do want an answer, right? I do want an answer, uh, <laughs> because it, although the proposed hypothetical legislation would be much more complex than any example I could give, do we fundamentally, as uh, Mr. Farr said, do we have a lack of a one stop? And the first question would be, if you have two states and you can't, you, I've tried doing this, I've gotten them in the room, but at the end of the day, if you have jurisdiction, state, and federal, you can't create a one stop. You, you have a minimum two stops. So the first question is, is it reasonable in a substantial portion of, of all, uh, uh, if you will, operations such as pesticides, which the federal government is controlling, endangered species, which are of cross-state state importance, is it in fact reasonable to consider re-federalizing something which didn't exist at this, in this state until it became federal law in, was it 1969 or, seven, no, 70? EPA. EPA. EPA was under uh, Nixon, but it was at 73 or 4 that it actually. Or the Endangered Species Act. The Endangered Species Act, though, was 1973. That was President Reagan, I think, signed that, didn't he? No, no, it would have had to been Governor Reagan back then, but no. Uh, it, was, it was Nixon. Don't you remember? He gave us all the good things. <laughs> but, Ambassador? Well, I'd like to hear the other panelists address the issue. But yes, it is. Uh, it's an extremely interesting notion. Uh, in my life, I've always tried to have less federal government and, and try to have more state government. Uh, and so it's a notion I'm not used to considering you want. And by the way, the con contrarian one would be, could the state opt out of the federal if it took full responsibility would be the other side of that same coin. Uh, you know, we have our own OSHA, our own EPA, our own this, our own that. Could, in fact, the federal government actually let go of the tentacles? And which would you prefer? Well, and in the state of California, all. I really don't want more state government. <laughs> <laughs> so the federal government would be welcome in that case, but well, I'm interested in hearing some of the other views. May right, I, please. May I, now this is a dialogue. Please. I, I think I think, and I'm I'm really serious about it. I think you've got to find a way to have that consistency among all. I mean, one thing it's in the unique in the Coastal Act. I mean, people all think of the Coastal Commission as regulatory, but when, once that was signed off, because the federal law says that that as the states get to determine the outcome as long as it's consistent with their plan. So if the federal government, for example, wants to drill for oil off in federal waters, as long as California can show that it, that is inconsistent with it, they get to veto that federal action. And um, I, I'm thinking that if you really got into this regulatory process, which is what you're all talking about, mm -hmm. you're going to have to have a sign off that once you've cre created this uh, um, plan, so to speak, then the locals control. And as long as that plan doesn't violate federal laws or state laws, and you work that out in the planning process, uh, you can go ahead and carry out your practices. Because I think you'll never get to it once you can have one office you walk in and you still keep all the chairs on the Titanic and it sinks because it's, uh, it's they'll still go out and file lawsuits and I don't know how you clean up the lit litigious uh, atmosphere. Uh, unless all of the governments are in one room agreeing to the, the uh, similar outcomes. Mr. I, I think it needs to be very carefully approached, and I'm going to use Yellowstone Wolf as an example here because there are two different states who want two different objectives, one wanting to turn it over to the federal government and let them make the decision, and the other wanting to take local control. Both states want the wolf delisted. Neither are getting their way. I think what they, this, 
approach needs to say that if the states want to take this over and handle it, that they are the sole survivor and take that over. And if they delist it, then that's their choice. So I think that it needs to be a careful caveat that, that if the states do decide to take this control, that they have the full and final say over it. And I agree, California doesn't need more government, and I'm not necessarily advocating that, that our EPA take over that role, but I think this needs to be carefully couched because otherwise you're going to have, a, again, another division of, of, of responsibilities and another opportunity for a litigious, rich environment. Now, uh, my second question, which will probably sound a lot less rhetorical, if, uh, if, if consultation is in the law, not notice, but consultation, isn't consultation without a deadline simply a opportunity for an entity to veto it? Isn't that what was woven into a lot of your testimony today, that when the federal government requires or encourages consultation, we have to also limit that time period so that unless the two parties agree that consultation must continue and they really are having a dialogue and they need more time, that ultimately consultation is, is notice with an opportunity to respond and not an opportunity to veto. Isn't that what I think what I heard from each of your statements? Yeah, unfortunately, there's no definition of what consultation means under federal law. And well, I, so I, these I, things I, can go on forever. Uh, what, what, what's been really difficult for agriculture is when they start entering into these consultations and even when the lawsuit settlement discussions are, are ongoing, uh, it's the request of the plaintiff that until these things are resolved that you stop using these particular chemicals or pesticides, whatever they are, uh, or that you put a buffer zone in between what you're growing and the water or what could be transferred uh, by air elsewhere or into water. And so they've effectively stopped it without ever having gotten a verdict in their favor. And so that part of the process needs to be changed so that, in fact, if EPA has already approved the use of a pesticide, and it's a registered pesticide, that they can continue to use it unless, until someone says this shouldn't be used because it does endanger XYZ species. Would you all pretty much concur with that? Yeah, I'm going to actually respond to your previous question as well and then and then segue into what you just requested when you were talking about driving down to a local jurisdiction the lowest common denominator obviously that's always the easiest re way to accomplish a result and when I reflect back upon my own testimony and look at the common thread here is that we have mandates being forced upon us without a real sense of cooperation at the local level or creation of some cooperation between conflicting bodies if you will and I know representative far you you were um, very um, uh, accommodating as well as um, reflecting in some of your comments I've read in the past about the 2004 Ag Waiver that we implemented here in the Central Coast some time ago and the progress that we made on that. And now we have a 2011 Ag Waiver proposal on the table. Uh, there's been a lot of knowledge and a lot of discipline built from that process, which is kind of what you're describing, Chairman Issa. And if we can just continue that process. I think we'll we'll get to a common ground sooner. That, that, that was a bottoms up process. Essentially what we've done here is because of the National Marine Sanctuary and worried about water quality into the sanctuary, it's a collaboration between uh, the, the landowners and uh, sort of the Department of U.S. Department of Agriculture has been putting up the money to do this water management quality study and it's it's been a model for the whole country in fact th this administration is now prepare is now proposing uh, uh, a program called the SWAT team to essentially get everybody in the room and do exactly what we're doing so we we started this process long before anybody else in the country thought about getting everybody in the room under one roof and working out a process and by the way it was voluntarily and it wasn't there was no penalties involved if a farmer wasn't doing things right they learned the right way to do it and uh, it's been a very collaborative process and people have learned a lot from it and I think we've had some good results we don't need to change it 
Now I'm going to open a, a subject that uh, I usually try not to open, but because I think here in in, in uh, farmland, it's it's particularly one that's coming to uh, to a head. Uh, all of your industry uh, members, or you individually as farmers and packers, are now under the mandatory E-Verify requirement. Uh, is it fair to say? and I'm not talking about your individual companies, but it's fair to say that in agriculture we're dealing with probably, depending upon where in agriculture, anywhere from half to all of the, uh, the hires on a given week are going to be undocumented. And that if we don't come up with a effective program that provides legal labor, well, in fact, we're saying E-Verify causes you to, uh, to not hire the available labor, that in fact we're heading for a train wreck in agriculture uh, here in Salinas. 